I've done a few interviews with Louis Simmons, with the first one back in 1998. This interview was further along for an article called West Side Rules, which I wrote for the February 2007 issue of Flex Magazine. The basic idea was so that bodybuilders could see exactly how exciting the powerlifting sport is. When I did this, the interview wasn't put together for others to listen to, just me putting together the article. But it actually sounds very clear. Louis shares great answers. I feel it has a better, clear conversation than he has done in most videos or previous podcasts. If you're glancing at the YouTube pages, the photos are all ones that I have taken. Some in the old West Side gym with the front window sprayed with black paint, and then other ones at the larger new gym. Enjoy. Louis Simmons interview, 11 6 How did, uh, basically, Lou, how did you get uh, started it with, in weight training? What was your original exposure? Well, I was a little boy. I was small and weak, and I wanted to be big and strong. I never got too big, but I got really strong. And uh, what was the uh, what was the state of powerlifting when you got started? That was when I started. My first power meet is 1966. It's just re just beginning of powerlifting. I remember I seen an old picture of you in um, Muscle Builder Power back in the. Do you, do you recall that? That was back in the time when they did a lot of the, the West Side articles. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. No. Okay, uh, I might have that. If you want to see. I started Olympic lifting. Okay. And when I went to my first power meet, I never had went back to Olympic lifting. Power was so much bigger and stronger. Uh -huh. How did you uh, How did you come across like even now Olympic lifting? There's so few coaches. Well, there's a whole problem with no coaches in the United States. You got the athletes. Everybody's got athletes. Powerlifters, American powerlifters. We we have seven of the twelve total records, and uh, and we we have no uh, you know financial funding in America. And power and Olympic lifting, they have millions of dollars behind them from the government, and they can't win anything because they don't have the coaches. Mm -hmm. What was the? Um, how, how did you develop your system? Obviously, what you're doing is so much different from everyone else. All right. Did you use a traditional? Powerlifting system? Yes, for 13 years I did. From 1970 to 1983. And in 1983, I broke my back for the lower back for the second time. And I was uh, on, you know, in my house for 17 weeks. Couldn't do anything but stretch, reverse hypers, acupuncture, acupressure. And I said, there has to be a better way to train. Uh, that's when I started getting all the literature from overseas. And uh, to this day, I still get literature. Many people from overseas send me special literature from all these, these training system and of course you know, the still regular Soviet Union system. Okay. And I combined actually the Soviet Union system, the conjugate method, the dynamic method, the maximum effort method and so forth, with um, the Bulgarian system and the maximum effort because each today for instance say maxed out on a spatial suspended good morning. Each week we switch. Might not be an all time record but you constantly max it. was that a training injury the your your back? Yes that was true. Okay. First time in seventy three I broke it. Uh, doing heavy good mornings. The second time, I believe I broke it just doing heavy heavy training for 18 straight weeks. And how did you come up with the reverse hyper? Was that after the first injury? Yes, because in 1973, when I broke my back, every exercise I'd previously done hurt, and uh, no one was going to fix me, so I had to fix myself. And uh, it took about a year because I was on crutches. I broke it in the latter part of 73 and 74, I was on crutches for almost 10 months mm -hmm. and no one had any solutions for me so uh out of desperation i just came up with that exercise and it worked um west side has a, has a huge following athletically what's can you talk a little bit about that what's what, yeah, maybe what NFL teams, teams. Okay. um and back in 96 when the Patriots played green bay Packers, both both three coaches spent a week here with me i have a picture of them shaking hands on the super bowl field uh, Johnny Parker just this year spent a week with me. He's with the San Francisco 49ers and making a bit of a turnaround. You know, football's football though, um, and uh, I don't think weights had that much to do. But a better system is a better system. But Seattle Seahawks, many many teams, many colleges were actually were huge overseas in rugby. The top rugby teams uh, come here. I've had five top rugby coaches come here, and uh, just totally 
revolutionized their training for rugby, so they say. What, what about track and field athletes? Have you done? Yes. Uh, well, I trained Kevin Akins for 20 years. He held the Ohio State record at 70 to 10. And um, what from Sprinters in Jamaica. And um, the kid over here in the uh, United Kingdom holds an indoor sprint record. He does all West Side System. Okay. West Side System is big in track and field. I just was a speaker. I was one of the speakers at the National Throwing Convention. I've actually been on the cover of the Long Thrower magazine. Never been on the cover of Power Lift in the USA. <laughs> just for, for coaching. Uh -huh. uh, training. Have you had any any uh, did you have any contact with any of the original West Side guys, Friend and and Two uh, West? I talked to George Friend. I never talked to West. He died. Um, I wish I'd have been able to go out there. I never was. I'd never be able to make the journey because of work and obligations. Um, uh, right now, I talked to a guy. Actually, his name is Rudy Rudy that trained there originally in the '60s. And matter of fact, he's 67 years old. His bench was 380. He started doing his system six months ago and just been 413. That's great. Yeah. Um, I'd like to give back because I learned everything from that system. And then we just we just modernized this what we did. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, how would you describe the atmosphere here at West Side? Very intense, very competitive. Um, we have uh, world record holder in the 242s in the code. World record holder in the 181 spot, 905. Mm -hmm. Chuck Bogle pole, 11 ET squat in the 275s. Um, we have two extremely strong women. Uh, Amy Weisberg was an all time fellow record at 123, 132. Um, holds the world record in the squat at 148 and 575. We have Laura Phelps, incredibly strong girl, 725 squat at 165. Um, 405 bench and a 510 deadlift, so 1640 weight, 164 10 high bar. Wow. Amazing. Uh, what does it take to be a part of the club here, and, and what do you, what qualities do you look for? Um, mental toughness and quickness. If you're quick and, and you're mentally tough, then you have to have a body. Mm -hmm. We have a kid who just graduated from high school, um, 242. He's been here two years with us. He's already officially squatted 870, six, 570 bench and 670 deadlift. So we bring in one person and we put them with one group. So where many people, one coach has 30 athletes, we take eight We take eight people basically as coaches and teach one new person that way, nothing goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, do you ever dismiss members and what, what would? Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, if you're not with us, we got a saying and everyone does, you must be against us. Uh, uh, and if, you know, so if you're not standing behind us, if you can't travel with us, I mean, economically, everyone can't go everywhere. But if a person just refuses to go and help after we go help them, they actually get booted out. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> now I have a bunch of questions on GPP. Uh, you introduced that, that phrase to, to most lifters. Uh, how would you define GPP? General physical preparedness. That means it's raising your work capacity, basically. All right, in a general sense. In other words, you just to bench more, you don't you just keep bench pressing. Um, uh, that's called the law of accommodation. If you do something over and over and over, you can only get worse at it. If you, once you learn to spell your name, you can only spell it wrong. <laughs> so we use uh, special exercise like now, George Halbert actually trains bench seven days a week. You know, George has broke 11 world records in three different weight classes, all time world records. Mm -hmm. And um, he does, uh, for instance, one thing he does, and I got this from the East German shop putters, uh, four sets of 15 in a dumbbell press every other day. It goes flat, incline, decline, seated. Now, George can use 155s very easy for four sets of 15, but he uses 110s. A moderate. Always train optimally. Dr. Schiff told me that. It's the smartest thing he ever did. As smart as he was, that's what really set into my mind. Don't train minimally, don't train maximally, which I always did. Mm -hmm. Train optimally. Like a fighter, a heavyweight fighter is only going to throw 40, 50 punches around. If he throws 80 punches the first five rounds, he's throwing back this corner fight. Mm -hmm. Train on. Um, what are some guidelines for GPP? How can someone determine the proper vo volume and uh, how would they increase that? Okay, that is, that is determined by your level of preparedness. If you're prepared to do a lot of work, you know, you start in, what I try to get people to do where we normally have two speed workouts and two max effort workouts a week. I'll get them to do one extra workout for the bench, 
and one for the squat. So they work out six times a week. Then it grows to eight, then to 10, you know, sometimes up to 14. And, and what, what are some of the options that, for, I think a lot of people don't know what's, what would constitute a GPP workout. Okay, for lower body sled dragging, Sled dragging is just enormously beneficial here. Um, a lot of throwers overseas do uh, lots of sled dragging. Sled dragging actually makes me stronger for squatting and deadlifting than lifting weights. And uh, for heavy weights, we'll pull 200 feet and a minimum of six trips, which would be 1,200 feet. Sometimes we'll pull as much as a mile and a half with lighter weights. Lighter weights will condition you. Heavy weights will make you stronger. And a big mistake people make in America, you always see the commercials click clack and so forth. And you got the AJ Hawk sprinting with a sled. Everybody knows or should know that running with resistance distorts running form, as with a parachute. So, uh, so what we do is uh, for sprinters, for instance, we walk power walk with sleds, heavy weights, you build every essential muscle that sprints, and you don't lose your coordination. We jump with resistance, ankle weights, weight vests, dumbbells, and for instance, and because jumping with resistance will not distort jumping. So we work for a uh, fast rate of force development, and that's what jumping would be, with no hardly any resistance at all. And then maximum effort, powerful legs. I just wrote an article about it, supposed to leg power. And it shows a person jumping on a 59 inch box. Wow. Well, what, uh, <clears throat> what kind of things would, would, tell me if these things would constitute something to use for GPP. Uh, kettlebell swing. Yes, we don't do a lot of kettlebell swing. Are you okay. Familiar? Uh, how about uh, strong some the strong men movements like a farmer's walk? Yes, to some extent. Okay. Uh, it, what what is it? What, what determines it? Is it? Uh, I know with the, with the with the sled pulling, there's not an eccentric component. Is that always going to be a part of the GPP exercise? Yes. Or? That's right, because eccentric work makes you sore. Okay. So we stay. You know, we try to stay away from a lot of eccentric work. This morning, you did concentric. Good morning. Crawled mm -hmm. underneath and it stood up. Right. Um, but GPP for the upper body, it could be dump, it could be dumbbell presses, like I mentioned. Lat. Just take a look at your body and say, what do I like? You ever see someone you say, man, that guy's got big arms, but he really does. He's got really small shoulders. Yeah. So you work on the shoulders. What you don't have, work on. Gotcha. Okay. And, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, and you know, like football, in football in general, they do too much practicing. That's SPP, spatial physical preparedness. They practice and practice, yet in game you see them make all these errors, you know, blocks in the back, missed tackles, fumbles, so forth. Um, I believe in football they should do more general physical preparedness, but the, the kids have already played football when you get to the pros for years. They're almost bored of football at that point. Gotcha. Um, how does one know they are working on conditioning restoration and not creating further inroads into their recovery abilities? Uh, that is what you have to learn individually. You don't have someone watch you closely. I've had a lot of people from overseas come here and a few years ago try to work out with me and totally destroy yourself and they were world champions. Because uh, I got a high work capacity and Chuck Google has extremely high work capacity. You have to work yourself into that high work capacity. So I say just slowly but surely add workouts. You know, like George, you know, every other day with the dumbbells. Um, he does lat work. Today he was doing upper back. It's a constant thing for him, but he has a very high work capacity. Mm -hmm. You couldn't bring a beginner in here and do that. George would bring a beginner, do the two workouts, and, and, and they only bench press, maybe two specialized, like a lat workout, an upper back, and a tricep workout during the week, and that's it. And those workouts are only 20, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. So practically non stop. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I've heard of people adding muscular weight gain just from sled work. Does that, does your experience? That's true. The average person in the gym, uh, if you're 230 pounds or so, you're going to gain 40 pounds in two years. Mm -hmm. We have a high work volume of work. You know, as volume goes up, intensity goes down. And so in other words, light weights, high reps, or like sled drag. And uh, that's what makes you, and bodybuilders, the reason bodybuilders have larger muscles because you do repetitions, it works with proteins in the body to make large muscles. When you do singles, it breaks the protein down differently. A lot of people actually get smaller, but much stronger. Like that's called the weightlifting system, where you only do singles. But see, even they, you have to back it up with lots of extra workouts. So more, more of a neural stimulus than that's right. a contractile protein breakdown. Yes. Okay. Uh, should how should how should sled work be, or should sled work be done any differently if your if your goals are a 
workout warm up, B, restoration, C, increasing GBP, D, muscular weight increase, or can all these attributes be increased simultaneously using the same protocol in the sled? Okay, this is how sled work has to be done and it will serve all functions. Um, our max every day is the day Monday. So that's when the heaviest sled dragging is performed. That builds muscular strength, absolute strength. The next day, the weight is slightly less. It builds strength endurance. Then the weight is actually decreased once more. That's restoration. And then back on Friday, when we squat, a couple sets of light sled dragging, which is a warm up. Okay. That's, how it's, that's how it should be done. Okay. Um, is there ever an, ever an application in which you would recommend someone do reverse hypers with a slower eccentric phase, like controlling the lowering of the... It should be under control. Okay. When you raise it up, you try to hold it. The, the reverse hypers have three muscular phases, concentric, eccentric, and static. When you raise the weight to the rear, um, concentrically, you try to hold it, which heavy weights, of course, you can't. Then you fight it down about two thirds, relax, let it pull you under the machine. That opens up the disc and rehydrates the disc. All right, and then again, um, raising the weight to the rear. Okay. Um, this next group of questions is gonna be about structuring a workout. Okay, starting with the dynamic effort. Uh, what is the function of the dynamic effort exercise? What physical qualities are being met? All right, dynamic method, you use sub-maximum weights and maximum speed. It does not necessarily make you stronger, but it creates a fast rate of force of which for us, it plays a large role. You have to, if you have 500 pounds of the bar, you have to exert much more than 500 pounds and make it travel the distance due to the length of your arms. And in sports, fast rate of force development is everything. First step in basketball, for instance, back in football, all sports like that. Okay. Uh, is dynamic effort sets any different from compensatory acceleration or just two phrases for the same thing? It's the same thing, but compensatory acceleration is Fred Hatfield that phrase years ago if you don't use a band to change it's true not, it's not true because you will decelerate the bar okay all right everybody a bar set deceleration you know it starts out it's picks up speed slows down and stop but if you use bands uh, it's with the contrast method and um, accommodating resistance you can eliminate the deceleration phase okay which is very important we do all dynamic work is done with bands or chains or a combination of both okay uh, you have fine-tuned uh, dynamic effort workouts over the years. What are the proper intensity percentage ranges for benches and box squats? I've seen some different numbers as the years have gone by. All right, for bench pressing, we pretty much go off a rule about 40% of what you can bench for a single in a t-shirt. Uh, my one fellow, he benches 570 in a t-shirt, and he does his speed work with 205 in a minivan, which is 48 for chest and 85 on the top. Okay. For box squatting, it's if you go if you're a power lifter, we all box squat at 50 to 60 percent of a one rep contest max. If you are not a box squatter, you're a pure, pure athlete or just a gym rat, you train basically at 75, 80, and 85 percent of a one rep box squat max. Okay. It's pretty much going to be the same thing, but just two different views. Now, if you look at the management of the weightlifter book, it talks about in Olympic lifting, which is an explosive speed sport. Um, 50 percent of their training is from 75 to 85 percent so i follow the same thing because that was research is done on over 1,000 highly qualified athletes okay um would those percentages change uh from, from a beginner to a more experienced athlete at all possibly if a person is slow and they can't move weights fast it does you have to lower the weight i, I had fighters uh, who were fairly fast with their hands because there's no external resistance but slow with weights I mean, the max you train at 10% less and make great progress. Okay. Uh, maximum effort stuff. Uh, define a maximum effort set and what are the guidelines for uh, how many max effort sets one should do? All right. Max effort means just that. You only have one max effort in you. So you work up to a max effort. Let's say in the rack deadlift, if your best rack pull is 700 pounds at the knees, your goals will work up and do 710. Okay. Max effort. There's no time limit in maximal effort exercise. It's time under tension with no time limit. Okay. Does it matter how many how many sets to work up to that or uh, whatever is appropriate for you. you know, a lot of people can make ninety pound jumps, some have to make fifty pound jumps, depending on how keen your central nervous system is. I've watched a few people in my gym, Chuck Vogel pull one, deadlift three fifteen, and then load the bar to eight oh five and pull back. 
Imagine that does no warm ups and opens up in the dead of dawn about 750 towards the zero warm up. Well, <laughs> Uh, is it safe for me to say that the introduction of bands and change in the West Side system corresponds with the biggest leap in lifting totals? Absolutely. Okay. And and how did the how did the bands and chains come about? Did you change? I talked to uh, an old gentleman. He told me I was talking to him about uh, training and uh, weight releasers. He said that's similar to what they used to do with chains. How they would deload chain and come back on the course. The weight releaser comes off the bar. And you have no, nothing on the bar as you concentrically raise it. But change, of course, you have deloading, then a reloading. And uh, it worked great. It took us up, it jumped our spots well up. And then when bands came along, um, the coach at, um, at Liberty University called me up and wanted me to try to use bands. And uh, he said he would pay me once I discovered what to do with them. <laughs> and his name was uh, Dave Williams, Coach Dave Williams. So I said, well, I'm not going to charge him because he's a friend of mine. But I got the first time I got a hold of Ben, I realized this this would revolutionize weight training. And the, the advantage of bands is overspeed and symptoms. If you triple velocity, you square kinetic energy. That's nice. That's why people do depth jumps and they jump off boxes and you land at this near the speed of gravity, 9.8 meters per second. If you were to jump off a, a box that's uh, 3.4 meters or approximately 10 feet, your body, it actually almost multiplies your body weight 20. Hmm. So then you have a, 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 it's called shock training. In America, that's commonly called plyometrics. The true name of it is shock training. All right. And by doing that, it builds a stretch reflex. The human body has internal strength, external strength, and reversal strength. And so, of course, for anyone who has a lower weight before you raise it, reversal strength is at the utmost. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we, that's why bands work so well. And, and how should someone use bands? When they, what are the guidelines? When they connect bands onto the bar for any lift, make sure you have tension at your chest or tension on the, in the bottom, at the bottom of the box block or even the pulse block that we prefer much. And, and what, uh, how much tension should someone have on the bands? Okay. If you want to train with speed strength, Basically, you have about 40% bar weight, like a thousand pound squatter here. We have nine over that. They will train with, uh, you know, 405, 40%. Band tension at the top is 260. So roughly, if you look at it, and, it, and then on saying on the box, the band tension has shrunk to about 100. So you have about 50% in the bottom, bands and weight combined, and 65% at the top. That would be your speech. Strength speed, which is commonly known as slow strength or just absolutely super strong individuals with heavy weights, again, like I said, with no time limit, you use more band, at least 50% band and 50% weight. It will slow the process down, duplicate the time it takes to do a maximal lift in a conventional maximal lift. Okay. Uh, what's the best way to uh, to figure out how much the weight is at the top? Do you just get an empty bar and a, and, and a scale? And That's exactly how we do it. Like a, a two by four or something on the scale. To... That's exactly how we do it. We okay. weight it like that, and uh, just be careful weighing it. When you, our model, if you, we can jack the model out the weight, so it tells you how much in the bottom and how much at the top. Okay, gotcha. Um, and if one band's two hundred, two sets of bands is four hundred. Yeah. So you gotcha. don't have to like continually. And we use as much as over seven hundred pound of band pitch in here. Now that's extreme, but mm -hmm. I have a very extreme people. Two over eleven hundred in this one. Um, okay, with the repeat effort uh, sets, uh, what is the function of the re repeat effort sets and what would be the drawback to building strength uh, by just training the assistant exercises with dynamic effort and maximum effort uh, protocols? The assistant exercise would be heavy, like tricep extension sets that you refer to or back raises, not enough weight. Okay. And also muscular coordination, it develops coordination. When you, when you do the dynamic method and you do um, interval method where you're taking a particular amount of rest with a particular amount of weight per set mm -hmm. in uh, for maybe eight sets um, it builds your technique anybody can use that type of weight and have absolutely 100 technique and build explosive power okay and when you're working for speed strength um, you want to be at around 0.75 meters to about 0.9 meters per second on the concentric pose that would be um, strength speed Okay. And I'm what, sorry, speed strength. <clears throat> and what is the function of the, of the repeat effort sets? Um, volume. Okay. 
you know, year, you know, years ago, I would listen. I would, you know, if I could squat 600, I'd hear about these Russians doing eight sets with 550. Well, no wonder they can squat 700. Mm -hmm. Builds work capacity, uh, technique, you know, central nervous system. It, it, you, you, I know you've mentioned in some of your writing that you can you can tell by the volume that someone does how much they can do in a meet. Right. Does does that translate to everyone? Like if. if let me just say, if you want to squat 600 pounds, you had to be able to train between 50 and 60 percent of that, which would be 300 and 360. Mm -hmm. And if you add that volume up, if you took 10, 12 doubles of 300 and 7,200 pounds, you know you would have 600 times 12 doubles of 7,200 pounds. In a three-week wave, you know you jump five percent, and you get to 60 percent of 600, which is 360 pounds. For 10 doubles, if you look at 7,200 pounds, so it's truly flat loaded. You have to do 7,200 pounds of squats with roughly a minute rest to be able to squat 600. Mm -hmm. If you 800, it would be 400 to 480. See, that's as you get like, if I could squat 600, you only squat 400, you could train side by side. You train at 50% of your 400, I train at 50% of my 600. Mm -hmm. That way, our volume matches our absolute strength and you don't overtrain. Always in gyms, I see the one strong guy and everyone else falls by the wayside mm -hmm. because everybody tries to duplicate what he does and the other guy. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> what should the uh, rep ranges be on the repeat effort sets? I've seen kind of a variance in your programs. Are you talking about our speed swaps and stuff? No, the, uh, I guess I should say your your assistance work. Our assistance work can go way up. Fred Bolt's done 34 reps on 100 pound dumbbells. But what I mentioned a while ago with George Howard, four sets of 15, an optimal amount. Mm -hmm. um, recently, I did 24 reps of 100 pound dumbbells. I used 70, four sets of 15. Mm -hmm. I could probably get 35 reps of 70, but I do four sets every other day. But if you add that volume up, you know, you're doing 60 reps, I do 60 reps of 70 pounds every other day during the week. George Howard's having unbelievable success with it. Mm -hmm. What what is the uh, what's the proportion of, of dynamic effort to max effort to repeat effort be in a in a workout or like let's say in a week uh, would be an easier way to well you know the first is a dynamic method then we do the repetition method on the special exercises you know, we're going to do what reverse hyper sport six sets of ten or two different three sets on one on a strap hyper three sets on a roller hyper for instance then they might do uh, about four sets of four to six reps in a glute hand raise with weight, all right? Uh, that, and then abs and some lats and they're out the door. You should, we normally do a major exercise and then two to four special exercises when we're going. Okay. You don't want, it's, you don't want to do a hundred exercises. Um, that, that way you have to switch. You have to switch exercise quite often, but you, you push as hard as you can. So you're not going to make any progress in maybe 10 days. All right, so you have to switch to another group of exercises. The only one that's constant in the gym is reverse hybrid for restoration. Okay. It's the only thing they never change. Uh, how, do the, how do the trainer requirements uh, of a bodybuilder differ from those of a power lifter? Just a gener generalities. Um, different type of proteins, different repetition sets, different rests. Okay. And, uh, what does West Side Salad Training have to offer someone whose goals are directed more towards getting bigger, bodybuilding? Yes, it will make you bigger. I trained a fellow years ago in the infancy of this program. His name is Jimmy Seicher. And it's uh, Jimmy, when he squatted 500, he won Mr. Ohio. When he squatted 650, he was Mr. USA. He certainly fits in Mr. America. The stronger he got, the better bodybuilder he did. He came and he actually squatted exactly like us, wide stand squats. And then he went to extra, his extra workouts were in normal gymnasiums with leg, you know, extension, hack squat, leg press, mm -hmm. and so forth. Did, did he train a few year round? Yes. Okay. The only time, even during, uh, he would only stop uh, even heavy power training about a month out. Mm -hmm. Back then, before bodybuilding became so sophisticated, um, you know, if you didn't have hard, strong muscles, you couldn't, they wouldn't cut, you couldn't separate, get muscle separation. Mm -hmm. A lot different now with diet and so forth. Yeah, yeah there, there seem to be a lot more uh, multi-sport athletes that can do both. Uh, okay, you already talked about the average weight gain. Um, if a bodybuilder wanted to use West Side techniques to increase both their muscle size and powerlifting totals, uh, well, how, how would their program be set up? I, when I talked to you 
few years ago, you had said something about uh, the, the twice a day, which you mentioned. Uh, would, they, would it be like four times a week with the morning and evening workouts? They could do the exact same workouts uh, that we do. And then I absolutely go, just like my friend uh, Jimmy Saichi would go later on and do the leg, go on the, on the lower body leg press and uh, back his kicks. Of course, lots and lots of laps, you know, lap days, and everybody would go in the glass. And uh, upper body is the same thing. They can come in and max out because if they're stronger, they can handle bigger dumbbells. They can do more weight on pec decks, you know, mm -hmm. actually have more muscular endurance to more to do more longer so. Okay. That's what most bodybuilders on a muscle biopsy would have more slow twitch muscle fibers, where they could do longer you mm -hmm. know, workouts. Power lifters are very explosive and they have uh, you know fast twitch muscle which contains very little oxygen and wears out very much. Okay. That's why, if you ever notice, look at a sprinter, a 100 meter sprinter, he looks like Mr. America, and a marathon runner absolutely looks like he's on his death day. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, one of the things that I always thought would be a great article would be, in, in each of your uh, things in Pilot USA, you talk about different experiments you do. What are some of the experiments that you tried that just didn't pan out? Um, okay, the kettlebell benching, we connect kettlebells to the bar, underneath the bar with bands. And so that you have an oscillating, uh, tension, chaotic state. But the bells are, when you're pressing up, the bells are going down, left and right, forward and backwards. That was tremendous. We've got tremendous success. We tried to squat that way in a total disaster. Mm -hmm. Okay, two of my, one of my top, Amy Weisberger, you know, many world records squat, and total disaster, and Matt Smith, who's 1141 squatter, total disaster. Mm -hmm. right. It works for good morning. Some things it works for, some things it doesn't. Okay. That's one of the things that didn't work. Most of the things <laughs> it actually works. Uh -huh. you now, what we found, the one thing we found in the very beginning, and it cost me a shoulder socket, and it cost George Hobbard a shoulder operation. Uh, I, I, when we started using bands, I used an excessive amount of bands that actually ruined my shoulder. And George did the same thing in the bench, and he actually had to get a shoulder operation because it was excessive amount of bands was too hard on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, if you don't put too much salt in the soup, you never know how much is too much. Yeah. <laughs> so we paid the price, but the rest of the gym benefited. Okay. Uh, from a genetic standpoint, what lifters, regardless of whether or not they, they've ever reached their full potential, do you think were the most gifted in powerlifting? Uh, Eddie Cohen, Eddie Cohen, um, Kucher from uh, Russia, Mike Bridges from America. I would say those three are about the three strongest men. Of course, Paul Anderson, you know, 50 years ago, so mm -hmm. it's a freaking Okay. Uh, what lifters do you think have the best mental focus, drive, and heart to be a powerlifting champion? Chuck Vogelpool today, um, Larry Pacifico in the 80s, in the 70s, you know, the 70s early 80s. Uh, Larry, was, uh, Larry was always not a sure fire bet to win, but he always won. He was mentally tough and always won. He was one of the greatest power bets I've ever seen. Mike Bridges it was a walkthrough. Eddie Cohen was a walkthrough. Uh, Kucher is a walkthrough. But when people actually have to have stress and win all the time, I kind of put them up. Mm -hmm. Very strong, not quite as physically strong as those three, but mentally very good. You know, mm -hmm. What, uh, have you ever done any analytical tests on, on your lifters to see uh, things like, like the amount of explosive force, something like Chuck Vogelpolk and... We have a unit called a Tendo unit. Mm -hmm. All right, measures of meters per second and also power output, but we use meters per second. The only reason we use it is to, uh, to prove things. For my, for my write uh, articles, to mm -hmm. prove I have it in paper. And a lot of my articles are backed up by physics professors and calculus professors. I use them to make sure that uh, you know this is very valid. I mm -hmm. run it by them, and they, they basically validate it through mathematical forms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what, do you, what do you see your legacy in the powerlifting world and how would you like to be remembered once you hang your belt up? Through training. I did a few things. A few people did in powerlifting. I mean, there's been better powerlifters than me for sure. I won a World Cup and a national championship. But as far as training, I, I basically uh, took training to a completely new level. 
throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like to be remembered for. And uh, my reverse hyper uh, in January of 2007, she built national television. And everyone has bad backs. And this reverse hyper is going to go, okay, we'll fix a bad back. It fix, I broke mine twice and it fixed it both times. Mm -hmm. I came back to make, um, you know, I had the third greatest squat and the sixth greatest of all time when I was 52 years old. And uh, after breaking my lower back twice, took my bar vertebrae and have a complete rupture of the delta in it. It was all due to the reverse hyper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, would, I was going to say that if that was the only thing that you had you contributed, that would be a huge thing. Yeah, the reverse hyper, I mean, it's going to, it will do stuff that, you know, I'd like to be remembered for. Having United States patents, I have three United States patents. I feel pretty uh, special, even though, to me, they're simple, mm -hmm. but just to have a United States patent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about, I'm going to throw out some lifters' names that you've worked with. You can tell me a little bit about them and them as a person and them as an athlete. Uh, Matt Dimmel. Matt Demo was one of the mentally toughest super heavyweights I ever seen. That's, that's very, very strong. He wasn't afraid of a lot. He, he would do. I watched Matt bench all time bench records with no warm ups and deadlift all time deadlift records with no warm ups. It's, that's tough for a person mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. um, how about Matt Smith? Uh, Matt Smith has his own way of doing things. Nothing ever seems to bother him. Um, if he has a bad knee, the next meet will be a great meet, and he never looks he never looks bad at bad meets, and he doesn't get too blown up over the good meets. He does. He's constantly, and he's just now starting to learn how to train the bench press. He's got a lot of potential on the bench, and it's just now he's been 749, and so his bench is starting to come up where it belongs. Okay. Uh, Chuck Vogelpool. Chuck Vogelpool is probably the most mental person I've, I've ever trained. Uh, you know, had to. ever worked with in my life. I mean, he is so determined. He's about, if he says he's going to do something, you know he's going to do it. Even though it sounds impossible to you, it's not impossible because he absolutely will do it. Uh, how long have you been working with Chuck? Chuck's been, Chuck's been with me. We've been training partners for 20 years. Uh, how old is he? Chuck's 41. Okay. Uh, Amy. Amy Weisberg is a very determined female lifter. Um, no athletic backgrounds, but Broke many, many world records in three different weight classes, and um, just very, very determined and 100% West Side. Many people have West Side tattoos. Even people in the NFL have West Side tattoos, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of proud of that. You know, I don't see too many World Gym tattoos. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mike, uh, I'm not sure if you're from Ruggeria, Ruggeria. Uh, when Mike was here, Mike's retired. Uh, Mike was physically, very physically strong, never come close to reaching his potential. Okay. Uh, Mike Francois. And, and, you know, let me mention, I, I saw something where Mike, he lists you as one of the three people that he learned the most from during his career. He, uh, it, same thing. I think his potential was unlimited. Too bad he, you know, he felt his illness. And, uh, I mean, I was amazed when they first brought him in the gym for me to work with a little bit. I mean, I've never seen anyone built like that, and it's just amazing. And uh, but we did a lot of experiments with him; it was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Seitzer, you mentioned earlier. How long was he? Did, did Jimmy train with you? Uh, Jimmy must have trained with me uh, probably, you know, constantly hard in powerlifting and bodybuilding um, for about uh, ten years, from um, probably uh, seven early seventies to the mid eighties. Mm -hmm. And we're still really very close to mm -hmm. Uh Rob Fusner. Rob Fusner uh, just coasted to the lips he did. He never pushed himself. He had so much potential. It was incredible. And he had a bad injury. He tore back in and off. And uh, a lot of people don't seem to be able to come back from injuries where others do. Mm -hmm. So he's retired as well? He, he retired. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John Stafford. John Stafford is very strong. Uh, holds himself back. You know, he's got an unlimited potential. 832 deadlift. He's, he had the biggest push pull in the 275 of all time for recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd like to see him regain that. And he's uh, he has unlimited potential. Okay. Very, very smart. He understands the system well. Where a lot of people don't even understand our system in our own gym. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a student of the game, and, and that's, that's a good thing. Okay. Uh, Bob Youngs? Uh, Bob Youngs did a lot with a little. And um, 
you know, he uh, he made some pretty good lifts. I think he totaled over 2,000 pounds. And that was good. He came here. He wasn't very strong at all. And he learned the system. Uh, then he moved forward. Okay. Uh, Dave Tate? Dave Tate, very smart individual and a very good businessman. He was actually my best training partner I ever had. Okay. Um, he, uh, just for lie, cheated, that's the kind you got to have. Someone <laughs> always trying to figure a way to beat you. And uh, real good friend. Very, very close friend. Okay. Now, who, who have I left off that's a significant member of? Well, now we have uh, Phil Harrington, world record holder in his squad. Squats 905 or 181. Phil's a dynamo. And, uh, you know, he's a you know, off the cuff kind of guy. And, but he's West Side. When Phil moved here, 100% West Side. And Greg Fedora. Um, Greg wanted to come here for 10 years. He's uh, 25 years old. At 15, he wanted to move to Columbus. But he got a degree. He works with um, uh, problem children. He moved here. He had a, he could total 2455 and was stuck for two years. And in six months, Greg went to two meets and total 2485, world record total. Extremely strong. I don't put many people in the class of Chuck Vogelpool, but physically he's in the class of Chuck Vogelpool. His dementia is completely different, uh, but extremely strong. Okay. Um, let's see, did I, did I not include? Um... Big Tim Harold, I'd like to mention him, one okay. of our supers. Very young, just very, very young, early 20s. He's already told 25, 50. He's had a few small injuries. He has unlimited potential. He's 6'7", uh, weighs 420 pounds. He's already deadlifted 855 pounds. Uh, he has uh, unlimited potential, and I think in a couple of years, he's really going to stand up. Does uh, Does Arnold Coleman train with you? Arnold Coleman come in and train. He got an injury. He trains here uh, in the bench in the squad. He's an uh, all businessman. Mm -hmm. You know, you know how athletes are. Sometimes you almost need like bones in, in a way, you know, where powerlifters got to be first. Arnold's got a lot of um, you know, his businesses and his family and his daughter come first. Mm -hmm. Where most of our people, my wife have been married for 32 years, but she knew powerlifting is first. It has to be first. If you want to succeed, you, know, you have to sacrifice. People don't sacrifice, you never succeed. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, just a couple of things on different exercises. Uh, shoulders, knees, and elbows seem to be the areas most prone to injury and strength athletes. Uh, how should one balance? Flexibility with stability. For example, how much shoulder mobility is ideal for a power lifter? You need to be working on because the average power is going up about 40 pounds bigger than Mother Nature intended to be. So we do a lot. And for lower body, we do a lot of uh, actually a dynamic football drill. A lot of people don't know that, but Matt Winnie came here. Matt has a, a, a master's degree in exercise science from Ball State, doing quite well, probably total 2,400. And when he came here, he brought the dynamic stretching. So we started doing that and it helped quite a bit. A lot of kettlebell work really helps the shoulder flexibility. Um, hamstring and seated calf work will completely take care of the knees. That's what stabilizes it. Calves below them, hamstrings on the other side behind them. On top. What, what type of kettlebell exercise do you do for shoulders? Basically shoulder twist and all the bench pressing. Okay. I have a shoulder socket. Uh, and I, I sometimes couldn't get past the bar. I'd use the bar five, six cents, couldn't do it. Now, next time I bench 300, but I started doing all these kettlebell benches and I've cambered bar bench 365 pretty easy. with mm -hmm. shoulder socket. That's totally unheard of. Mm -hmm. um, for an athlete, uh, does excessive torso rotation leave one open for injury or cause a loss of strength? No, I actually think you need to have, like golfers have a lot of bad backs. I think they lack to, uh, the rotation of the torso. That's what they kettlebells can do. You know, a Russian twist, walking, walking twist. Uh, you mm -hmm. need to do something. You have to have it all. Because, you know, if you only train inside of your sport and you get outside your sport one inch, you're going to get hurt. Okay. But uh, what's, what's the point of diminishing returns? Obviously, if you're like one of these yoga guys with this leg up over your head, that's you're going to lose some of the, the yeah. reflexing. Of right. You can be too flexible. You know, you can be not flexible enough, which I am, and now that I'm older, I'm 59, and you can be way too flexible. If you're too flexible, you can't build strength. Contortionists, they claim one of their problems is they can't build strength. It's very hard for contortionists to build strength. The old people above their heads, so mm -hmm. you know, the pyramids. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, 
What are the best assistance exercises for tricep strength? What, what do you guys do? I see you guys do a lot of the, the dumbbell. Uh, a lot of dumb, roll back dumbbell extensions, elbows out tricep extensions. By roll back, you just kind yeah, of start it off. Back, put all the pressure right in the elbow. Okay. If you roll back, you, we, no one in my gym has bad elbows. Nine guys over a thousand in a squat, 19 over 700 in the bench with an 835 lead. We have no elbow problems. Uh, because we do a lot of uh, elbow rotation work in the extension, a lot of JM press, um, some easy curl bar. They do a lot of triceps with the kettlebells hooked to the bar. Very, very unstable, makes your body very stable. Mm -hmm. Works the stabilizers. Actually almost makes the stabilizers change roles with the muscles themselves. Very strange, um, but very effective. What Can you define a JM press? Just to make sure. The JM press are... actually is lowered straight down over the clavicle. Stops three or four inches off the chest, tilt the fist back at just a maybe a half inch, and you totally overload the triceps and the elbow, then fist first straight up. Okay. Very difficult. You should be able to do about 70% of what you can bench for one to three reps. I suggest always at least three to five reps. It's okay. very good stuff. Uh, could you give me some of your basic impressions, uh, considerations, or explanation of the value or any performance tips on, on these exercises, box squats? That's a big one. Box squats is the greatest weight squat. We prove it all the time, and people all around the world prove it. Uh, box squats, when you need box squat, you have a collision. If you have a collision, you have kinetic energy. Um, box squat, if you squat below parallel on a box, 10,000 squats later, you squat below parallel. If you squat, regardless of what the weight is, with everybody you always see in the gym as they add weight, they squat higher and higher and higher. Every squat is the same. So when you go to meet, your mind and your spinal cord know exactly when they come back up. Mm -hmm. Did you guys ever miss depth and squats? No, no. We actually call ourselves up. We go as low as they want us to go. Mm -hmm. We never, we never do. Occasionally, yes, you're going to get red lights. We don't always get red lights. Uh, we go to the biggest meets. The WPOs is the big, the WPOs is well, way over the world championship. Um, box squat. You could use a wider stance, which is the most effective because you use more hip muscles. The hips stand you up. Um, you could squat deeper on a box than you ever could full squat. And also, when a person does a squat, it, it requires three energy, eccentric, static to hold the weight, and to overcome a concentric. But in a box squat, you can break the eccentric concentric chain up. You can know yourself, set on the box, actually readjust yourself and come up. Mm -hmm. I've done experiments on stretch reflex. I sat on the box for, for eight seconds, got up at the same speed I normally would within one second. And people always say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, a long snap in football. Mm -hmm. That's what the big deal is. Stretch reflex commonly lasts two to four seconds. Four seconds of highly qualified athletes, but I proved that they much prolonged past that. Mm -hmm. uh, box squats, when you squat down your shin, it's actually pass straight up and down. Not knees over the feet, but the opposite way. To get up, if you think about this, you have to leg curl yourself up. You have to pull your heels and stand mm -hmm. up. All hamstring. I had a lady here, uh, board record holder in the squad, they tested her Ohio State. Her hamstring quad ratio was 60 hamstring, 40 quad. Never test, no one's ever mm -hmm. tested like that. Poliquin said the highest, uh, Charles Poliquin, 51, 49. But I told my Ohio State, I said, I've got a dozen people that you want to test them all. Because this is by the nature how we squat. Uh -huh. Uh, how about floor presses? Floor presses is about the eccentric concentric chain. Okay. And it builds tree. When you're going from static overcome dynamic like box squatting or um, or relaxed over dynamic, which both exercises do at the same time, it's the most beneficial. What what other exercises break up the eccentric concentric chain? Well we do dumbbells that way. Of of course, um, when you can you is there any lower back exercises that do that? We could, yes, if you lower the bar down into change and relax and then come up. Like, is that the called an Anderson? That's right, Paul Anderson, lots of concentric good mornings and so forth. But if you lower it, uh, that's what I finished up this morning. Lower the bar down, red, you know, pick the bar up out of chain, lower it, relax, pick it up, lower it, relax, pick it up. When you use moderate weights, it builds a uh, very explosive power. Okay. Heavy weights, it builds that with top absolute strength. If, to overcome a bar on the ground, that's what you have to do. To take a bar out of the squat rack, you have to overcome it. Okay. What about uh, Good Mornings? Um, they've got a bad name, but we live on Good Mornings. We do hundreds of Good Mornings, all styles, straight-legged, arched back, 
bent legged, rounded back, um, concentric good mornings. We do walking good mornings where you actually look much like a, a walking lunge, except you do, you bend over to the front knee, stand back up, step out, bend over to the, the right knee, and so forth. Hmm. It's tremendous exercise. I got that from East Sherman Shop with me. It, it, it's a serious exercise. Yeah, I've never, I've never heard of that one. Yeah. Um, how about good morning squats? What's the we do there? combination good morning squats. Chuck Bogopol does a lot. We'll take the bar out, um, go down into in, uh, in a good morning form, sit on the box, roll, and then squat up with an arch back. Or sometimes actually get down with an arch back, sit on the box, roll into a round of good morning, and keep your lower back arch, and then stand up. And as he stands up, he tries to straighten his back on the way up. What is, what is the value of the rounded good morning? Uh, that's something that people are going to obviously think is, if your is back dangerous. Flex, you know, you know, if your back arch is all fat, then you bend. But I, we believe that if you arch your back 50 times, you need to bend your back 50 times. Because what ha- if you never bend your back, what happens if you get it in a bent state? You're going to get it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you're, controlled. you're in a controlled environment when you're doing good morning. Always throw your stomach full of air. And I really recommend people wear a belt. It's a big controversy, but you need to wear a belt. You know, bodybuilders years ago had a touch system, touch your traps, they did shrugs, you know, all kind of thing. Well, that belt works as a touch system. You go down, you push out, you expand your stomach against that belt. It teaches your stomach first and your spinal rectus and lumbar reads second. That's where people get hurt. They don't wear belts. They don't know how to do it. Their, 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 their lumbar region will flex first. That's how you get uh, bulgy. Okay. And, and how much of a weight drop is it usually when you go from uh, arch to rounded? Is there one? Depending on how deep you go. People tend to go lighter than the rounded. I would say about 25%. Okay. Uh, glute ham raises. You guys seem to use those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do, I do glute ham. We try to do, the, the guys that are very strong in the squad here would do around 600 a month as maintenance. That's 20 a day to look at like that mm-hmm. as maintenance. That would be with no weight. We like heavy weight. Two to, two to six reps is what we like to do. Are, are bands the preferred resistance on this? Actually, it's 50-50. I don't like bands. A lot of guys do. I like the whole weights. Okay. Um, reverse hypers, of course. What can you tell Reverse us? hypers are done at least four times a week. Um, many of the guys will do heavy reverse hypers four times a week. Twice on Monday morning and evening twice on Friday morning and evening. And then on the bench days, they do about 50, 35, 33 to 50% of the weight for a couple sets of tennis restoration. Okay. And the last one, uh, board presses. Uh, board presses, I think, overused. It, I, we, I believe they test your strength and they really don't build your strength. If you're going to board press, do board press with bands. Um, if you start to use a lot of board press and bench pressures, for instance, it's almost like point karate. It teaches you to stop two or four inches off your chest. We've had disasters in here. My top guys that are most effective in the bench, which are actually my pole lifters, uh, seldom ever use boards. They okay. go right to their chest as quick as they can. But you guys, those have kind of fallen out of favor here. We do a lot of board press, but a lot of bands. Okay. The strong guys, got a 400 pound of band, and someone like me, 200 pound of band. Okay, um, I, that was all I had. I appreciate it. I may, I, I might have some questions. Obviously, as I, I have to talk to them and see exactly what they're looking. What I, what I pitched, and they haven't told me uh, exactly what they want was that we do short profiles on a handful of lifters okay. too. Um, I, there were three lifters. I mean, you know, really. I mean, if you want a, fee, you want a female. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I think that'd be great. Female. If we could hook them up, you know, um, and then probably my three record holders mm-hmm. in the males, you know, Phil Harrington, um, just respect if you want on squatting, and Chuck Vogelpool, and uh, and then uh, Rick Gould. Okay. Um, they want to send out a photographer. I have no idea when that would be. Is that something that's going to be what okay? What kind of stuff do you want to look at? Like, like maybe box models. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure uh, if they're gonna send someone for one day or two. Okay. But they're gonna fly someone out here. Oh. I told them I would take pictures, but their 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 level of photos is pretty high. I can get George Howard. He's in there every day. I'd like to maybe get you know he could do some bench stuff. Mm-hmm. He's worth eleven records. 
he's so strong right now that two or four times he's got bro. Uh-huh. I just he's I've got getting a guy ready for the Arnold. Don't even know, huh? He's getting ready for the Arnold. I don't know if he's gonna go to the Arnold or not. I okay. think he might not live. I don't know what he's. I'm not sure. Um, but I've got a guy. A lot of people have never even heard of him. His name's Nick Winters. Mm-hmm. On three different occasions in the gym, he's touched the code seven hundred five in a t-shirt. Wow. Six twenty-five incline. This kid is. He uh, he's been here about a year and a half. He's three twenty-five now. He's three sixty. Mm-hmm. Just work with George Howard. You know, a lot of people, and I made a point in some of my articles about this. Uh, you know, when people come here, I mean, they bench. I st- uh, George is radical, but I throw him to George. It's mm-hmm. your sink or swim. If, mm-hmm. they can, if they can swim to George, <laughs> the sky's the limit. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, I'm putting together training programs, and I have a, a lot of your writing, so I will, uh, I'd like to have you look those over to make sure I'm, I'm okay. representing what you guys do properly. Yeah, but, you know, if you're on speed stuff, you do eight to ten sets. You know, taper it up three weeks, drop it back, three weeks bench and weigh. Mm-hmm. You're gonna have it. You know, three seven stars, just take them right out of there. And then max out, like I said, work up like you if you could floor press four oh five, you want to warm up sufficiently of course, get there, get it over with, and get the heck out. Mm-hmm. Then uh there's a lot, you know, right this. But you know, you always wanna do like four oh five, like three sixty five be like ninety percent of four hundred. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know how weights go three fifteen for three sixty five, maybe uh 385 and then 410. Either take one more small jump or stop. Uh, three weights, one at 90, two, one getting there to a record or two small records and stop because you're just looking for injuries. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just too hard. I've seen, I've seen guys get their tech effects more often than mm-hmm. And it's just too hard. Beginners have never hurt doing this. Beginners can't push enough to hurt yourself and max over work. Okay. They just can't. You know, you're, in horse racing, the last horse never gets hurt. Mm-hmm. Don't need to <laughs> right? Yeah, you you you're very good with the uh, visual examples like that. Yeah. What what do you think about about your mind is unique that's that's allowed you to? You seem to you seem like you you're someone that would read something and pull out the one significant piece of information where everyone else reads the same thing. And I know. I don't know why. I know lots of PhDs that cannot figure the books I read. Mm-hmm. They're so easy for me. I don't know. I was a terrible student in high school. I never went to college. Went straight into the army in 1966. I couldn't have gone to college. Yeah. How did and, uh, How did you end up in Columbus? Would you? Would you I was working. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know that question. I mean, a lot of it because I truly wanted to get strong, and I had a lot of you know problems, broken backs, torn off biceps, not only biceps. Um, you know, been trach almost died when I allergic anesthesia from operations and mm-hmm. power lifting. I mean, this is this is actually my life, and it truly is. And as I see my lifting going down, I I have it's my obligation to make sure my guys keep Westside's everything to me. Mm-hmm. Westside, my business is totally separate from Westside Barber. You know, even though it's the same name, mm-hmm. the gym is, is actually my life. Uh-huh. And uh, you see every day. I, I mean, I have breakfast. You know, of course, workout four normal workouts. I all oh, I never have breakfast by myself. Somebody shows up have breakfast. With me. Uh-huh. Always go out and have dinner. It's like it's like a big family. Mm-hmm. And I think that means a lot, even though it's not a team sport. We don't enter teams, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but it's everybody is with everybody in this gym. They are 100 percent behind, even though we've got crazy, you know, three or four people in the same class, top ten in the world in the same class, uh-huh. which is doesn't even sound possible, but it's true. Mm-hmm. And so you, they got to train together. So you know, it's all just a big party to them. Then they go and whoever wins. Mm-hmm. What's uh, what, what did you do? How did you make a living when you start after you got out of the army? Uh, I was uh, in construction, always a steel wrecking, crane operator, and ran a construction job, steel wrecking. And when did you get to where you could just do this full time? I decided to do this in '91 after I blew my kneecap off, and I thought, well, you know, I mean, I could do this and make money and not have to go outside and work. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've never done personal training, I refuse to do that. You started out in a, in a commercial gym, like open to the public? Never. No, okay. I've never trained in commercial gym. I've always been in private gyms. Okay. We started out of my basement, me, me, for five years, and then we got training partners, and then we had to go into my garage, two car garage, then we had to start renting. Which is places. just like the original West Side. Yeah, that's right. It was in the garage. Yeah. And then, you know, as you see now, we're into this, and I think next year, um, we go in March, but when, uh, this hybrid thing, I'm going to open up a big place and I'm, I'm going to start getting a few guys to train athletes because 
in football, we can take three tenths. We've taken three tenths of, of a second. The last guy they sent from Oklahoma State, lineman, 295, he had a 5 foot 40. They said he could play pro ball. They sent him over three weeks. He weighed, this is this is unique, he weighed 308. He gained 13 pounds, he ran a 5 one forty. he plays for the Cardinals. Mm-hmm. We've got a guy, Dave Cadella, plays for the Panthers. And this, a guy came in one time and said, Louie, how would you train a high school football player? And he, he was here, he just got back from playing your football. He's just going to answer that question. What could be better? Than in a football player, and I go, yeah. He says, I do what they do, and then I go play football. Mm-hmm. And to, to add to that, Pat Irie from Missouri, we took, we showed him. He took three tenths off his quarterback, three tenths, mm-hmm. which he didn't even know he was going to do by doing what we told him. And he wanted to test the speed. He went from four nine to four six by only pulling a sled, walking with a sled. And Pat Irie said that exactly what that boy said. He said he played in the NFL for four years. This is a specimen. And he said he got cut, he made another team, got cut, made another team, got cut. He realized, I don't have any football skills anymore. Mm-hmm. So you never play football, you can. But the stronger, more powerful football player is going to be a better football player. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you got to have the skills and you better, you better get stronger. Than that. Uh-huh. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.